Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. On the first floor of the Supreme Court building here in Cheyenne is a new resource for the state of Wyoming. It's called the Judicial Learning Center. We'll take a tour and see what it's all about with the first female Supreme Court Justice of the state of Wyoming, Justice Marilyn Kite, and the Superintendent of Public Instruction, Julian Balow. It's not just for kids, it's for adults too. Join us as we tour the Judicial Learning Center next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you. We're now pleased to be joined by Chief Justice Marilyn Kite, retired, first um, female justice of the Supreme Court in the state of Wyoming, and Superintendent of Public Instruction, Jillian Balow. Welcome back to both of you. Uh, Thank you. To Thank Wyoming you. Chronicle. We're in the first floor of the Wyoming Supreme Court building here in the Judicial Learning Center, not yet a year old. We're going to take a tour here in just a little bit, but Justice Kite, let me start with you. This is something that you really had a vision of, and I want to ask you why you felt a, a um, display, uh, an area like this would be so important for Wyoming. Well, I think the court system in Wyoming and probably other states has always been interested in civics education and trying to explain to the, to the children and adults how the judicial process works. And it always seems very dry, and it's hard to bring it to life. I watched uh, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor on the U.S. Supreme Court talk about her iCivics program, which was an interactive computer game way of teaching civics. And she said she used to watch her grandkids uh, play games, and she knew they weren't going to be reading the books like she had read them. And so that kind of planted a seed, I guess. But then I saw what, the, what uh, Colorado did at their Supreme Court, and they have a, a much larger uh, center like this, but it just became obvious that that's the way you could see kids engaged in this interactive displays and hopefully really learning what those dry words mean in reality. And so that, that's sort of what started me thinking, and the Wyoming Supreme Court at the time was very willing to take it on as a, as a big project. I don't think we ever envisioned something this wonderful that we actually finally have. But it sort of came about as a result of that. We have our neighbors to the south to thank a little bit for the inspiration and in uh, and our court system for being willing to, to undertake it. But real quickly, many states don't have a, a place like this. Wyoming's one of the few. Oh, I think, yeah, I think most states don't. I know of a, a handful of other states' uh, courts who have something similar. In fact, the fun thing is they're now calling us about how did you make this project happen? and we are making available to them the content, which is hard to develop. Colorado was very generous with us, loaning us uh, a lot of the content so we didn't have to start from scratch. Superintendent Balow, I want to turn to you for just a moment. Obviously, many children are introduced to civics, to, to the judicial branch of government in Wyoming schools. How do Wyoming schools do that, and where do you see a, a place like this, which is, I need to point out, not just available here in Cheyenne, most of the resources that we'll see here in a moment are available online. That's correct. How does the state integrate civics education? And do we do a good job? Sure. So we, we have a framework for civics education, and uh, there it, it's our Wyoming content and performance standards for social studies. And one of the main standards is civics education. So starting in kindergarten, um, students start learning about citizenship, learning about personal responsibility, community responsibility, rules, responsibilities within a community. And, um, and, and it really progresses from there. So by the time that students graduate from high school in 12th grade, um, they're, they're analyzing political systems. They're um, mapping what's happened in our history to what's currently happening in our society and still talking about responsibilities and rules and federalism and governance. Um, you know, I, 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 there are some places across the state where civics education is, is taught in amazing ways through programs like iCivics and We the People. Uh, and, and oftentimes that's a passionate teacher or a passionate school district. Um, certainly we'd like to see that passion shared across the state. And I think that the Judicial Learning Center really sets the, the, um, the framework for that to happen uh, in, in many ways. 
Uh, you both um, had an opportunity to, to observe the legislature in the last session who considered a bill relative to civics education, and it didn't go the way you had hoped. Justice Guy? Well, that's, that's true. There was a bill to uh, establish the test that naturalized citizens have to take to become citizens of this country and to have every senior that, that graduates from high school pass that test. I mean, it was a very, uh, they could take it as many times as they wanted to, and we were trying not to make it draconian. But it only seems right that, that people who come to this country and have to learn about it shouldn't know more about our country than the people who are graduating from high school. And it was disappointing uh, because I know the legislature and the, and the people that are serving in the legislature understand the importance of civics education and, they, and they, they do talk about it, but we were not able to get that accomplished. But that might not be the last time they get it considered. Before we move on to another part of the building, um, both of you can chime in on this. Justice Kite, you first. Oftentimes when people consider the American system of government, I feel they're thinking about the legislative branch and the executive branch. And they may not be considering the judicial branch as, as much as someone whose career first as an attorney and then as a justice. Do you agree with that? Well, I think it's interesting because they usually talk about the rule of law. You hear people talk about that every day on TV, about the, we've got to have the rule of law. Well, there wouldn't be any rule of law if you didn't have the judicial branch to enforce the laws that were created by the executive branch, or by the legislative branch, and carried out by the executive branch. So I think that's true. I think the things that people see in current events <laughs> is usually focused on those two branches. And, and to me, the important thing is that the, the courts, to the extent that's humanly possible, are supposed to be separated from that political process and be unbiased. But you can sure hear a lot of people have opinions about what the courts say and do. Uh, but the important thing is, and we always used to joke that the judicial branch is the, is the weakest of the three branches. We don't have a, the ability to raise money and we, don't ha we can't raise an army. So it's only effective if people have trust and confidence in what the mm -hmm. courts do. And that's critical to, and they only have trust and confidence if they understand it and they, it becomes real in their lives. So it needs more emphasis, more study, more personalizing, if you will. Money was an issue in this facility, and the legislature helped, but there was also a lot of private support for the Judicial Learning Center. Yeah, that funding was our challenge. I mean, we had the space here that wasn't being fully utilized. Uh, the legislature was great in terms of giving us matching money, uh, which of course has worked great for the university and other causes, but the courts themselves can't raise money because of just what I talked about, of being unbiased and and not have any appearance of impropriety. So we were facing quite a challenge, but the Wyoming State Bar Association and the Wyoming State Bar Foundation really stepped up and helped. The, law the lawyers of Wyoming actually provided most of the private money. We had some other wonderful grants. The Wyoming Cultural Center gave us a grant, the Community Foundation, other grants like that. Um, judge Bremer, who was a federal judge here for uh, many, many decades, when he passed away, his family urged people to give money to the center in recognition of his service, which was great. But it all had to, we, if we hadn't had the matching, the money from the legislature, we couldn't have done it. And if we hadn't had the matching money from the community, we couldn't have done it either. We're in the, an area where people can see immediately when they come in the door of the Judicial Learning Center. And I should point that out. And there's a beautiful um, video they can watch, The Rule of Law. Teachers can also use this room to reserve right. and also um, teach right here in the Judicial Learning Center. Yes, yes. So we've got more to see. Let's, let's go on with our tour. All right. right. This is an 1,100 square foot facility at the Judicial Learning Center. And Justice Kite, um, there are many interactive displays, but you've told me this is your favorite. So let's start right here. Where are we at and what happens here? Well, we are at the You Be the Judge exhibit. Um, and the reason it's my favorite, although there's wonderful uh, content in the other exhibits here, is it really puts the person that's playing the game in the position of being a judge. And when I was a judge, it was always frustrating to hear people talk or criticize things the courts did without having the evidence and without knowing what the law required. Uh, they were quick to have their own opinion. Well, here you, you learn how difficult some of these decisions are. And my, you get to choose three different scenarios, a criminal case, a custody case, and a civil case. 
And my favorite to watch the young people and everybody uh, try to play is the custody case because they're close, tough cases. There's good parent, both people are good parents, but you've got to decide which parent gets custody. And the district judges in our state do that every day. Uh, Gut-wrenching decisions that they have to make. And you can see people struggling with what's the right answer. And when they finish the game, they can see where they compare with anybody else who has played the game. So you kind of get a feel for where your reactions fall kind of in the, in the general population. So our goal here was to make people really understand the judicial system. And in my view, this, this exhibit that makes them be the judge goes the farthest in that direction. Superintendent Mayor, what strikes me about, about this um, kiosk, if you will, is this wouldn't have existed when I was in school and how education is a little different today and, and kids learn in different ways. And I think this is a stunning example of that. Absolutely. Um, you know, Justice Kite calls it a game, but it's exactly how we, we want kids to learn um, through experience and, and through problem solving and analytical thinking. Um, it's also aligned with the, the standards that I referenced earlier. And so it's, it's a really wonderful way for, for students to learn, but then they can also take what they learned today and go back to their classrooms and continue that type of thinking as, um, as they move through the, their own curriculum back in the classroom. And is this the way education is bending towards a more digital, interactive type of experience for those of us that aren't in the classroom all the time? Yeah, in many ways it is. Uh, the Judicial Learning Center certainly sets the gold standard, uh, not only in terms of what we want kids to experience um, around federalism and the three branches of government, but also just in terms of having these opportunities to visit the Supreme Court and to um, to experience some of these um, some of these learning activities. And one of the great things that's happening right now is that uh, the Judicial Learning Center procured a grant to have a, a contest for lesson plans. Written so, by teachers. Yes, written by teachers. So teachers across the state um, right now are thinking about how they can write lesson plans to either use in the, the Judicial Learning Center or as a follow-up or a precursor to the Learning Center visit. And, um, and it's, it's a really wonderful way, again, to continue the learning in a, in a real way. And we have information about this on, on our program here. There's a web, website they can reference. There's a prize out there. There is. There's some money available for teachers if they want to participate, and they've got some time to, to still do that. For work. teachers and for their schools. Nice. Justice Kai, you talked about something, and I'm sure you, you've been involved in hundreds, maybe even thousands of cases. Can you recall for us a couple for you? You've referenced in the past that the school um, funding decisions were tough for you um, when you were on the Supreme Court. Are there decisions where you know, if you'd play this game, you'd be the judge that you might see a 50-50 split in, in how the general public might have thought it would come out or that were especially gut-wrenching for you? Well, I, th I think there's, uh, they all were gut-wrenching, frankly. <laughs> um, but uh, a couple that I remember that were particularly hard is when you felt there had been a legal mistake, which is our job to find out if there is a legal mistake, and you got to decide whether you're going to reverse it and make that family go back through this process, which is a terrible thing to do. At the same time, if you have something that's wrong legally, it's important to correct. And it were, those were the toughest calls for me in, in custody cases. You know, we always defer to the district court where they, they heard the evidence and, and determined the facts. So if it was a close question, the district court was affirmed. But where you found there was a mistake, gosh, do you make them go back and, and start the process over? And that's a, that's a very tough call for a judge. Another thing that you were focused on when you were on the judiciary was access equal access to the judicial mm -hmm. branch. Um, has that improved in Wyoming or maybe even across the country? Well, I think it is probably improved, but it's a, it's a huge problem um, because, you know, to get, unfortunately, to get through a, a court case, you usually need a lawyer if you're going to get your rights protected, and the lawyers are expensive. Wyoming, again, the legislature, I think this has probably been about eight years ago, started a a fund out of filing fees to fund uh, judicial, uh, uh, excuse me, legal 
support for people who can't afford it. Only if they can get that support are they really, is there a level playing field? So that's still a struggle. But the other thing that's happened is we've gotten a lot more of this online and they can participate online and represent themselves better. Uh, we still have a ways to go there in terms of electronic filing and other things. But the more, the more we can, as a judicial system, become uh, digital and have people have access that way, the, the, that problem will be exacerbated. So there's really an indirect benefit from something like this. Oh, yes. To, in the end, help people understand more about the judicial system. Well, and remember, this is online, too. We mentioned that uh, earlier. But they can go on and play this game in their, uh, anywhere, but in the classroom, certainly, so mm -hmm. they don't have to come to, Jack, to uh, Cheyenne to do that. And, Superintendent, how, um, how do you envision this will be used? There's a lot of construction going on right now in the Capitol Square mm -hmm. with the reconstruction of the Capitol, yet this is still open and available. Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's the dream um, that I share with many others, uh, that we have every student in Wyoming uh, in, in grades 10, uh, K through 12 come and visit Cheyenne at least once. Doesn't matter if you're in Laramie or in Evanston, or Powell. Absolutely. And, uh, and and again, the Judicial Learning Center has, has really set the gold standard for what we want these interactive experiences to, to, uh, to be. And so as we complete the Capitol and the new Herschler edition, um, it's, it's going to be really important to think about how do we have our students experience all three branches of government in a way that is um, maybe not equal to, but of similar quality to the Judicial Learning Center. Um, one of the unique aspects of Wyoming is that when our students visit a wonderful center like the JLC, they also will likely be able to visit with with an actual justice. When they go to the Capitol, chances are really good they'll encounter one of the top five elected officials. And if it's session, they'll probably encounter a legislator. And that just doesn't happen everywhere. And so it's all part of a, of a bigger package that we want every Wyoming student um, to experience when they're in Wyoming schools um, with, with that careful note or caveat that it's not only for kids, it's, um, it's for patrons of all ages. I can't emphasize that point enough. As someone who hadn't been in Cheyenne often, you really do see folks who are willing to engage, and I think that's a big difference as well. Yeah. So we're going to see some more of the Judicial, Judicial Learning Center, so let's continue our tour. All right. Great. One of the great, I think, experiences of the Judicial Learning Center is a timeline that takes the judiciary in Wyoming from territorial days to the present. What strikes you, um, Justice Scott, begin with you, when you see this beautiful timeline? Well, I, I think the one thing that strikes you is there's a tremendous amount of information here. And uh, this learning center is not just for kids, it's also for adults. I mean, true, we're seeing. Water issues, right. land issues, education issues. History issues, equal rights, women in the law, uh, Native American law and, and how it interacts. So there's a, it's, it's a tremendous source of information about how, where, we, where we started and, and, where we, and where we are today. Uh, it was also, I want to put a plug in for the Supreme Court, uh, the people in the Supreme Court building, the law clerks and, and the judges wrote most of this and it was really a big undertaking and of course trying to do their other jobs at the same time. So I'm very proud of this. It really gives you a full flavor of the history of the court system in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. So many issues. We, we certainly can't cover them all. We encourage people to come and look. But we're standing in front of the Native American display for a reason, Superintendent Bailey. Yeah, you know, first of all, every time I'm in here, I learn something new, and it's it's so um, amazing to see the timeline of our state told through the lens of the judicial system. Um, one thing that strikes me, a couple things that strike me, first of all, we're standing in front of the women in Wyoming, and I, I, I love um, all of the firsts that we have, including the first Supreme Court justice. Um, and, and then also the Native American uh, display. And in Wyoming, uh, just in 2017, the legislature passed the Indian Education for All Act, and, uh, and my staff and I are, are busy trying to implement that 
that um, with stakeholders across the state and, and really that was born from an idea that we have a small cluster of people who know a whole lot about our tribal history in Wyoming and every student in Wyoming should have the opportunity to learn about our tribal culture and, um, and honor our tribal culture in the same way. And so as I look at this particular part of, um, of the timeline, um, I'm struck by the fact that some of what we hope every Wyoming student learns in their classroom is also depicted up on the wall and uh, so they'll have one more exposure to it when they visit the JLC. There is some intersection with tribal courts and Wyoming courts, Justice Craig. Yes, the, the tribal court itself handles lots of, of the legal issues on the reservation and there's it, of course, is a, always a question of jurisdiction. Does the state court have jurisdiction or does the tribal court? But the tribal court takes a huge load off of the state uh, civil and criminal justice system by the, the cases that they handle. And then, of course, you have the federal courts that come into it. So there are certain cases that have only uh, jurisdiction in the federal courts. So it's a real interesting legal issue when you consider uh, Native Americans and the, and the reservation itself. So it kind of helps teach a little of the Wyoming. In fact, it's the case all the way along this timeline. You're learning Wyoming history kind of at the same time as you're learning legal history in Wyoming. And the Native American exhibit, if you will, is, is a prime example of that. You both are women that um, have a relationship to first. We've talked before, you're the first woman justice of the Supreme Court. But many people may not know that one of the first, the, the first superintendent of public instruction in Wyoming was she was a female. She was also the first statewide elected official that was female. Um, Estelle Real was her name. And um, she was, uh, speaking of, of tribal history, she was also appointed to oversee tribal education and was the first Senate, um, Senate appointed uh, leader uh, that was female. Justice Scott, why did it take us, and, and we'll get back to the Judicial Learning Center in just a moment, Wyoming mean, was one of the last states that had a female Supreme Court justice. Why, why was that? Well, it, it's a combination of factors and usually comes down to numbers. I mean, when I first went to law school, there were only seven women in the law school and only about five women lawyers in the state. And so it, we had to reach a critical mass to where you had women that had enough years of experience practicing that ultimately be considered for a, a judicial appointment. And, and that's primarily the reason. But, you know, we also have to recognize we have to, we have to recruit women uh, to want to be in the judicial branch and to, and to provide those numbers that the selection process needs so that there are more women. We had the first woman judge in the country, Esther Hobart Morris, in I think in the 1870s, I'm not sure the exact date, and it took us from that time frame to 1981, I believe, to have a district court judge that was a woman. And it was in Fremont County, uh, mm -hmm. Justice or Judge Kale. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, you know, there's a there's a problem. I guess you could look at it that way. There's certainly our history does it. We don't have the numbers of women in the judicial branch, and and so there just were fewer people who were qualified and willing and able to to serve on the Supreme Court. And while you're both with us, I mean. It is the case now where half the applicants, or even a majority now of applicants and participants in law school are women. In law school, that's correct. And mm -hmm. so that potentially could change. This state has, has an issue with representation of female elected officials, although two of the top five elected officials are women. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on more women becoming involved maybe in the legislative process real quick? Briefly before we continue our tour. You know, we're we're always trying to to create those opportunities for women through um, through different opportunities, uh, leap into leadership, and different forums that we hold to to really spur that interest in um, in females who also want to be leaders. Uh, and and you know, women identify many challenges in terms of why uh, they aren't more of a part of politics, either in the executive or the legislative branch or in the judicial branch, um, but, but we hope to, to help overcome some of those hurdles and certainly see more women in those position, positions because we have a lot of really wonderful female leaders in our state. And there still is now a female judge, Justice on That's the right, Justice, Justice Fox. Justice Fox uh, was appointed a year at, before I retired and I always regret not being able to serve a longer time with her. And you know, I think uh, you often hear women saying how important it is to have women in offices. and. Um, I think the, the issue that is lost is that half the population are women, and so you're losing half of the talent that's out there. It's the talent pool that you're trying to get the best and the brightest people to serve, and if you eliminate half your talent pool right away, you aren't 
arguably getting the best and the brightest or don't have that opportunity. So it's not just because we're women that we think it's important to have more women. But And in the judicial branch, it, I think it's important for people to see people on the bench that look like them and have a similar sort of personal experience in order for them to have that trust and confidence that I mentioned at the beginning that's so important for the judicial branch. And certainly Wyoming's judicial history is full of, of women um, on, on many sides of many cases and people can learn that here. We've got a little more of the Learning Center to see as we wrap up the show, so let's finish our tour. How does that sound? We're in the last corner that we're going to talk about today here at the Judicial Learning Center, and I think it's, a, it's an appropriate place to end, um, Superintendent, not only for you, but also for Justice Kite. Talks about this, this particular corner talks about education in Wyoming and how the judiciary has been intimately involved in education in Wyoming. Well, that's true, and I think primarily because Wyoming is one of the few states where education is a constitutional right and a, a fundamental constitutional right. The Constitution requires that the legislature provide a complete and uniform system in the state. And uh, as a result of it being a constitutional question, that has, has pulled the courts in to the decisions probably for the last 50 years. It's, uh, it's been uh, considered by the courts. And Superintendent, I mean, um, and we're not immune from really having some of these conversations again, maybe, but certainly it impacts you nearly every day. Absolutely. Whenever we're talking about school finance, and especially um, in light of the disconnect between revenue and um, the, the cost of education, um, there's, there's not a day that goes by where we don't reference at least one or more of the decisions that were, that, that were made by the Wyoming Supreme Court um, around education. And, um, and, and certainly it, every single case has prompted something different to be done in education. But where we are today is that as a result of the Supreme Court decisions, uh, the legislature wrestles with making sure that every student in Wyoming has an equitable and adequate education. And, um, and that really goes back to that constitutional, um, that constitutional right to a complete and uniform education. But regardless of your politics, here is a place where you can understand how the rule of law is interpreted. And you really encourage, not, like we've said before, not just children, but, but adults to come and spend time here as well. And I would really encourage adults who do come to set aside an hour, uh, maybe more if you can afford it, because there's so much to learn here. And it's in various degrees of complexity. I mean, a fifth grader can come through and understand a portion of it, but it's, there's a lot here for adults. And we love it when we see, especially in the summertime, we see a lot of adults coming in and, and learning about their system of justice. It's open every day of the week. Um, yep. Superintendent Bailey, we'll give you the last word about this as a resource for Wyoming's education yeah. um, relative to civics. You know, once the capital renovation is, is done, I hope that every student in Wyoming has the opportunity to come down and experience in, in a way similar to the, just, to the Judicial Learning Center, um, the judicial system and the judicial branch, the executive branch, the legislative branch, and also our wonderful museum that has so many um, great artifacts and, and history about Wyoming. And, and, um, and we hope that that's a gift that, uh, that all of us can share with each other through the years. Just to reinforce the location, we're in the Supreme Court building, which is across from the Department of Education offices, not more than a block away from Wyoming's capital. That's correct. Justice Kite, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you, and Superintendent Beto, again, pleasure always to visit with you. Thank you, Craig.